Hey guys, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi, and I'm here in the flesh with none other than Joe Schmid from Majesty of Reason. I've got his YouTube channel linked in the description of this video, and we're going to talk about his background today and just have a good time. Like, I, I just want this chat to be super chill, and you're actually here because we're doing this uh, the CC Exchange event, and you and I are going to be doing a talk tomorrow, which if you guys are interested, it's an event in Houston, Texas, and actually... And put it up on the screen here. There you go with Trent Horn, Alex O'Connor, Joe Schmidt, and myself. We're all going to be talking about things related to philosophy, religion. Uh, one of the things that Joe and I are going to be talking about, intellectual virtues and vices. And then Trent Horn and Alex O'Connor are going to be discussing why they are and are not uh, Christian. So if you don't know, Trent Horn is a, uh, he's a Catholic apologist. He's the Christian. And Alex O'Connor, he, he's like, if you don't know who he is, then what are you doing on this channel? Cosmic Skeptic, he's got like the big, he's what, 460,000 subscribers or something right now? It's ridiculous. Anyways, it's awesome to have you here. Yeah, I'm super excited for this. I cannot wait for our discussion because it's on the intellectual virtues and vices. And we were talking yesterday over coffee how that's so neglected, both in, I guess, popular circles and also education. So I'm, I'm super excited. Yeah, yeah, that is... I mean, just looking over the presentation and stuff that you put together, I and mean, we're, we're, unfortunately we can't like display like a presentation at this uh, this event that we have. But just looking over like all the notes and everything, I'm like super excited about that talk. Yeah, I can't wait to actually like go over all the details. Yeah, and we're also giving like tangible tips to try to develop these sorts of intellectual virtues and so on, and try to avoid the intellectual vices. So I think those tangible tips will also be good. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into your background then. Why don't we talk about, because this is like, we were trying to decide like, what are we going to talk about on the channel with you live, like on the on the show? And uh, I pitched this idea and we just kind of like thought that it was it was good to talk about because you haven't really talked about this anywhere yet is your background and like the fact that you grew up Catholic. Like I didn't even know that until yesterday. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what, what, so tell me like, why don't we just start from... The beginning. Tell me more yeah. about uh, you and your background and like why you started your channel. And yeah. All that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm in a family of four. I'm the baby and I'm the youngest. So I'm 21 years old, 21 years young, I guess. And, <laughs> and so, yeah, where to start? So, I mean, I went to a Catholic private school K through eight and also a Catholic school ninth grade through 12th grade. And so my family is very devout. We prayed and so on, and I was a very, very fervent believer. I prayed and I believed all these sorts of things. And yeah, we, were, we went to Mass every Sunday, uh, and we had theology classes basically every day. And this isn't one of the, like, the low-tier like, Christian schools, like Catholic private schools. It was very high-tier, like quality education, very focused on Catholic education and so on. So we had school Mass every other day. We had three days a week, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We prayed like at the beginning of every class and at the end of the day and the beginning of the day and so on. So yeah, I was definitely all into it. And so come maybe fifth grade, fourth grade, I think, I got my little iPod Touch. Mm -hmm. And so this is a while back, but I remember playing all these little games. You know, there's like that doodle jump game. I don't know if you ever played doodle yes. jump. Yeah, and they like bounced up yes. around all the... Yes, I did, yes. <laughs> on the trampoline. That was like my favorite, yes. yeah. And there was also... um. What was it? Fruit Ninja? So I played Fruit yes. Ninja. You sw swiped all the things. And also there's that game where you had like, you're trying to like catch all the different, um, what was it? Ice cream that fell from the sky and like you didn't have to catch the fish and things like that. But you're trying to balance the ice cream and there were like rainbow ones. It was super cool. Anyway, so I got my iPod Touch. And of course all my friends are downloading Instagram, right? So I was like, you know, I got to get with the program. So I downloaded Instagram. But you know, naturally enough, I'm, I've always been inclined to these sorts of like debate-ish sort of things, discussions. I've always been interested in... I didn't know it at the time, but philosophy, really. And so asking these sorts of questions, specifically in fourth and fifth grade, it was mainly abortion, because that's what my, my dad is really concerned about that. He's very, uh, very pro-life, and he kind of instilled values like that into me. And when we were, every time we went to school, or went back from school, because it's a private school, we don't really have buses, he would listen to Catholic radio. And so I was always listening to apologists like Trent Horn, and like Jimmy Aiken and so on. I didn't know their names at the time. From but, what age? Oh, ever since I can remember. So it was always Catholic radio that was on my, yeah. my dad. So it's always debating. So I've been exposed to this from a very, very young age. And so, yeah, I had always sort of in a kind of debate, but actually kind of cordial discussion, really, just probing things. And so that's always been in my mind. And so when I got this iPod Touch, I went on Instagram, I downloaded it, and naturally enough, I found forums and so on to discuss things like 
uh, abortion and so on. And like, I remember these were substantive discussions. It wasn't just like, you know, your five-year-old dog like, and making comments about uh, pro-life versus pro-choice. No, like they were actually substantive, like paragraph upon paragraph with strangers. I, I just remember it was like really good. So that kind of got me into the, the, the zone of thinking about dialectics, thinking about arguments, uh, who is the burden of proof, like learning different fallacies and so on. And so, yeah, that's fourth, fifth grade. Moving on, we get to seventh. I can't believe you were thinking about that in fourth <laughs> and fifth grade. I mean, it explains a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, start them start young. That's, that's how I see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, come sixth, seventh, seventh grade, really, seventh and eighth grade, well, we started learning about uh, evolution because Catholicism, I'm very grateful for this, but Catholicism is very open to science. So that's wonderful. And so, yeah, we, uh, they taught evolutionary biology in the classroom and we talked about it also in theological terms. We talked about how um, God could use this sort of process. Um, and, and so on. And so that really got me interested. I remember we actually watched, because this is 2014, right? So this is my eighth grade year, I think. We watched the Ken Ham, Bill Nye debate, and we had to write like a paper on it, reflecting on it, tying it back to Genesis. Oh this is in our science class. Goodness. So we were basically doing philosophy of religion, philosophical theology in our science class. It was super cool. And of course, we also did like hardcore science. Like I loved my science teacher. Oh my goodness, it was so wonderful. <clears throat> um, Quick reminder that uh, the microphone is a little hot. Oh. So yeah, it's like it, do you know what do you know what I mean by hot? I don't. It's a uh, it's a little bit sensitive. Oh okay. So if you talk too loud, then it's gonna like start peaking and stuff. As, as people I know, know you're excited. As yeah. people know, I get very excited. Yes, I'm yes. Very excited about philosophy. It's very <laughs> exciting. That's a good reminder though. Yeah. So yeah, when oh, where was I? <laughs> uh, you were talking about your Ken Ham, like oh, yeah. you were in that science class. Yeah. So yeah, the science class was watching. just wonderful, and we were yeah we were watching that. We had to take notes on it. We watched it as a class. It was just super fun, and that really piqued my interest in evolutionary biology. Some people know that I actually just graduated from Purdue, and so boy, you rock. minored in biology. I minored in biology, yeah, because I, I have a love for evolutionary biology from that from that sort of experience. So yeah, um, we learned about that, and naturally enough, that of course got me interested in questions about how that relates to Genesis and evolution and things like that. And I had never really been exposed to doubting the like the literalism of Genesis and so on. You know, like that is like a literal six-day creation event that happened six thousand years ago. I'd never been ex exposed to sort of doubting that. Um, but I found resources like BioLogos Institute, um, Francis Collins. He has this book, The Language of God, I think it's called. Yeah. Yep. Um, and he actually, you know, was like the head of the Human Genome Sequence Project or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I really like that book, and that kind of sparked this interest in just the interrelationship between evolution on the one hand, and like theology, Christian theology, philosophy of religion, and so on. So I got into Biologos, and of course, once you once you start getting into those crevices of the internet, you never go back. So like, I started reading Biologos, started reading up on books, I started debating online, uh, on Instagram, mm -hmm. on evolutionary biology. And, and at this point, you were coming from a Christian perspective? Catholicism, yeah. I was like, uh, so once I learned about the evidence for evolution and so on, uh, I was pretty firmly in the kind of theistic evolution camp, mm -hmm. um, following Biologos, following Francis Collins, and so on and following various Catholic apologists that I'd listened to. And so, yeah, I was firmly defending, the, firstly, the compatibility of um, uh, Genesis and, and evolution and so on. Um, but secondly, I guess this worldview where these are interwoven and where science and faith are kind of united into a kind of harmony. And so, yeah, I, I started debating that. And of course, naturally enough, you start debating people who have different opinions than you on these sorts of things. So. I not only was debating online like young earth creationists and so on, but also like atheists and skeptics who thought that evolution is not compatible with Christianity, these sorts of things. Yeah. And so reflecting on that and my own reflections at about ninth grade, so this is freshman year in high school, I started grappling with the suffering in the evolutionary process. That's really uh -huh. what kicked started the philosophy of religion stuff and what kick started my kind of skeptical, uh, I guess, attitude. So yeah, just the, the horrors of the evolutionary process, you know, animals for hundreds of millions of years, right? We're not just talking about thousands of years. We're not just talking about thousands of days, but like hundreds of millions of years. Like I can't even like grasp that. Yeah. But hundreds of millions of years, animals are like ripping each other to shreds. It's nature red in tooth and claw. You know, you've got predation, parasitism, languishing, suffering, all this stuff, you know? Um, and I mean, you know, I remember in 2020, we had these forest fires in Australia and like koalas were just being like burned alive. And you know, everyone thinks this is like a tragedy, but it's like, this is nature. Like this is this is the workings of the natural world. This is the very means by which I thought it's a drop in the bucket. Too. Yeah, it's yeah, like exactly just a yeah, just that's a glimpse one, of how deep it is. That's just in Australia, just yeah. for a few weeks. Yeah, think about not just Australia, but the entire world, all of Africa, all the United States, and so on. Those are the only countries, not even countries. Those are the only places that exist. Of course, now I'm kidding. And 
<laughs> That's such a stupid joke, isn't it? Um, but yeah, so mm. that really got me questioning. I mean, just the profound profusion of this and just the very fact that this was the means by which God brought about biological diversity in humans. Like that, that was, it really, really got at me. It really pulled at me. And so naturally enough, I looked at the arguments from evolutionary animal suffering because that's really what was pulling on me. Mm -hmm. I got into the work of Jeff Lauder from uh, what, it was infidels.org and Secular Outpost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I got into the work of Paul Draper in like 10th grade or something. I remember I watched the debate. And then you like eventually like studied under him. You're coming full circle because I just studied under Paul Draper at, yeah, at uh, it's Purdue amazing. University. It's so cool. Like he kind of kickstarted the process and I'm, now I'm back with him. He's, he's so great. But but yeah, um, I remember what sort of got me into the metaphysical naturalism train was reading up on, on Draper, reading up on Lauder. Uh, and I watched a debate between Lauder and Turek. Um, and it was it was a very good discussion. And it was one of the times where you actually see it, like a, an atheist take like a positive position in a debate and offer evidential chips for their position. I thought that that was really fascinating. So yeah, that kind of got me into metaphysical naturalism. So come ninth, 10th mm -hmm. grade, I'm, I, it was a gradual process, of course. This is a very gradual process of questioning, talking with my peers, talking with priests, talking with my teachers, going online, debating people, reading, bunch, reading bunches of books, reading websites, and so on. So it's a very long process. But uh, eventually I was like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a metaphysical naturalist. Pretty, pretty firm. I mean, it, I was never certain, of course, but mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty firmly in the camp of a metaphysical naturalist. But then come maybe junior year, something like that. Sorry, I, I'm just checking my phone because is it hot in here? No, it's fine with me. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you were like getting hot because... Oh, no. It's, it's, okay. definitely, it's definitely me. It's making it hot. No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, come, come okay. like uh, junior year, I uh, got into the work of, uh, you know who, Josh Rasmussen. Oh, I got yes. into the work of Josh Rasmussen yes, and, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, Alexander Proust. And I, I always like to say that... Wait, wait, in, put me on the timeline. Where was, when this was this? This is junior year. or Yeah, about junior year. So this is... Junior uh, year of Ninth and tenth grade okay. was when I became a naturalist. Okay. Um, and then about eleventh grade, kind of in, in between eleventh and twelfth. So kind of bridging into twelfth, I become well, an agnostic. It's a very long process. Mm -hmm. But what kickstarted that was the work of Alexander Proust and Josh Rasmussen, predominantly. And it was mainly Alexander Proust. I remember I picked up his book, The Principle of Sufficient Reason, a reassessment. Yeah. And as Kant said with respect to Hume... Uh, that Hume awakened Kant from his dogmatic slumbers. Proust awakened me from my dogmatic metaphysical naturalist slumbers. So, so he definitely awakened me to this whole world of contingency arguments, the PSR, explicability, the just really good quality theist philosophy of religion. Yeah. And so I started reading up into Proust's work. I read his Actuality, Possibility, and Worlds. I basically read every, any Proust that I could get my hands on, which is why he's my favorite theist philosopher in terms of his work. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then Alex, uh, Josh Rasmussen, I'm watching YouTube throughout 9th, 10th grade-ish. I remember watching Cosmic Skeptic when I was uh, younger. <laughs> uh, I still uh, occasionally watch it, of course. Uh, of course. If I have time, I don't, I don't have time. But <laughs> so Yeah, you're too busy pumping out like 12-hour 12 12 videos. 12-hour long videos, Jeez. yes. I was uh, very, very proud of that video. It's yeah, one, of my, yeah. one of my best videos. Um, what we're talking anyway. about, he uh, yesterday he posted a 12-hour response video to our... Uh, I did a, a video with Chad... Macintosh and we just it was basically just to to help people understand the the vast breadth of the dialectic right now in, in philosophy of religion There's so many different arguments for the existence of God that have been published And so this was basically just like an overview of those arguments We cited different papers mm -hmm. and stuff to help people really like dig in if they wanted to look into these arguments further and you've basically just people some some of the, like uh, My followers have been like, you know, this is like Oh no, he's like posted this like response video. But no. the point is like you're basically building on the it. The point is service. Yeah, yeah, you're building on it and you're adding to what we've done. Yeah, what you did was so amazing because so many people haven't even heard of 80% of those arguments, probably yeah. more. Yeah. Like no one has heard of Emmanuel Rutten, for instance. You, I think you were introduced to his work through that. Right? Yeah, the, yeah. His cosmological arguments and what he's done on epistemic arguments. And I've so already on. forgotten like 90% of the arguments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but you know where to find them. You know where to look. Exactly. And that's the beauty of your guys' resource. It's precisely because I thought it was such a valuable resource that I was like, we need some sort of comparable resource for the, I guess, responses to those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so I saw so much value in your guys's video that I wanted to put together something that was of comparable value to people. It's all about serving people, right? But we're not in this to like build up a tribe or something like that. I want to give people resources. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm telling people like this is, I'm evaluating these arguments from my own vantage point. None of this stuff is knocked down. I'm trying to explore this with you guys. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's not really even so much a response video. It's an exploration video. That's kind of how I see it. So, so it, let's it was, go back to your yeah. story. Your story. Yeah, you were. We're on Proust. Uh, now. Proust. Yeah, he's he's awakened you from your metaphysical. Yeah, my dogmatic slumbers. Slumbers. Yeah, yeah and uh, so 
I was watching YouTube, that's where we kind of left off. Oh yeah, and, when Josh uh, asked me. Yeah, so I, of course, came across Worldview Design Channel and I binge watched like everything <sighs> from him. And of course I was like, this guy's very interesting, I need to email him. So I emailed him and I gave some objections to some of his modal cosmological arguments. And then Josh is so wonderful with his time, we, both, we went back and forth for hundreds of emails and then we just developed a relationship from there and so then, um, yeah, we so really cool. got into stuff. Uh, we talked about, I don't know, we shared papers, we, we just really delved deep into each other's views, into trying to serve each other with our, our arguments and so on. So he's also a huge influence on me, uh, he and Proust, really. And so, yeah, and I picked up their book, Necessary Existence, and that kind of also pushed me more towards agnosticism. And so after this whole process of watching their videos, watching and reading Alexander Proust and Josh Rasmussen, their lectures, their videos, and so on, I was like, I can't maintain naturalism anymore. Just yeah. uh, firstly, because the literature is so vast and uh, the evidence is, is just so much on both sides. It's so many books written and so on. It's like my mind is so puny compared to all of this. Uh, and it's so that, that almost kind of a smack of epistemic humility in my face. But in addition to that, it was just the quality of their work and so on that pushed me like, plausibly there is a necessary foundation to reality. And uh, you know, what is it like? And that's a really big question that I like to investigate. And so that, that all kind of pushed me towards agnosticism, where I kind of land today. And it's not an agnosticism where you can't in principle know one way or the other, you can't have justification one way or the other. In fact, I think that there's significant justification on both sides for a kind of robust metaphysical naturalist view and a robust theist view. So you just think that they kind of counterbalance. They kind of they roughly counterbalance. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't have precise probabilities right now, at least, but they roughly counterbalance the evidence and justifications by my lights. And it's all an individual assessment, right? Yeah. We each have our own unique evidence bases. Yeah. I know you've talked about some of your videos. Um, like, if someone asks you why you're a Christian, you're just going to say my experience. My experience, like, yeah. not like personal experience of like, oh, you know, not sort of that, but maybe that. <laughs> But like, but also you're just experienced like talking to people, the books you've read, the order of the books you've read, the, the videos that you've watched, the people that you've had discussions with, like you, this huge epistemic structure that comes into making you, you. We almost have each unique world views, really. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so I, I wanna ask you a question about like, at this point, if you were to be convinced that Christianity is true, would you become Catholic or would you become like Protestant? Which one would you? So before you answer that, I actually wanna do, a, um, Something real quickly, okay? So there's a guy, a friend of mine, his name is Mark Lozano. He runs Christ Centered Capital. I wanna let you guys know about him. If you haven't heard of him, you need to go look him up immediately. ChristCenteredCapital.com, it's, uh, it's linked in the description of this video. But basically what he does is he takes financial assets like stocks and cryptos, and he curates them according to like a Christian worldview and says that like, he actually looks into these different companies and businesses and cryptos and is like, do what these, financial assets are actually all about. Does it line up with the Christian morality? Does it line up with the Christian worldview? And so he basically does like an ethical screening of these different financial assets. And he's done all of the hard work for you. I mean, if you're investing in anything with your money, then you need to be concerned about what you're actually putting your money into. I, I mean, that's, that's, that's my view. So if you're into investing at all, he's done all of the hard work for you, Christ Center Capital. And what's really, really cool is that He's recently changed his business model to where it was like $7 a month to subscribe to his newsletter and like get all the different uh, financial analysis and everything. But instead now it is completely 100% free. So if you go to ChristCenterCapital.com, linked in the description of this video, you can find all of the information that he's curated. Uh, I mean, it's it's a wealth of resource and knowledge and everything. Even if like, even if you don't invest and you're like trying to get into investing, this is a great resource for you. So I want you to go check them out, ChristCenteredCapital.com. Again, we used to have like a promo code and all that, but now it's 100% free. So go check it out, ChristCenteredCapital.com. Okay, so back to this question. What would you, would you become, would you like go back to your roots? Would you like, cause I know that you have some reason to think that Catholicism is false, mm -hmm. right? Through like divine timelessness. I think that's like one of your arguments. So anyways, where, what, what would you like, if you were to become convinced that like Jesus rose from the dead, where, do you, where would be like the most natural place for you to go at this point? Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, I'd want to do more research into like the real nitty gritty of Catholic doctrine on the model of God. Because as a lot of people know, um, so in addition to all the YouTube drama, uh, all the YouTube um, pusillanimity, uh, <laughs> in addition to all the YouTube drama, um, I, uh, I do like scholarly research and one of my big areas of research is models of God. Mm -hmm. So like 
Um, that's models of how God relates to the world if God exists. That's nice about this debate. You don't actually have to be a theist. It's just if God exists, what would God be like? So it's about the nature of God. What is God like in himself? What is his relationship to the world? Um, asking questions about uh, God's relation to time, God's relation to space, things like that. And so <clears throat> I think that for at least pretty high octane traditional versions of what we can call classical theism, where you have divine simplicity, all of God's attributes are numerically identical to one another and numerically identical to God himself. There's nothing intrinsic to God that's distinct from God. And divine timelessness, where there's no succession whatsoever in God's life. I mean, you can't gain or lose properties or anything like that. Um, with respect to that kind of high octane classical theistic view, I, I myself do think there are some pretty significant challenges to that. Yeah. So that's a big barrier. But so I wonder if Catholicism like really like look, requires that. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah. That's that's what I'd want to get into. I'd want to look yeah. into that. Like, this would be a great topic of, to talk to Trent Horn about. Exactly. So like, what yeah. kind of divine simplicity is is truly required? And like, I mean, does it does it matter how you de define part? Because the traditional classical theistic view of parts is extremely liberal. Like, you list anything and it's basically a part. I mean, I mean, as long as it's a positive ontological item, so anything that is being or reality that's intrinsic to God but distinct from God, it's going to be a part. But like, what if you have a different conception of parts? I mean, what if what yeah. if you have what if you think that um, God <laughs> isn't built up out of His properties? There's, there's nothing more fundamental than God, but God grounds His properties. Is that a kind of maybe lessened view of simplicity that you could hold? I mean, that's a somewhat simplicity. There's just fundamentally there's just God Himself. Just this one positive ontological item, and he grounds, it's a kind of whole to, I guess, property grounding. He grounds his various um, attributes, say. So you don't even have to say that those attributes are parts. So I want to know, like, what counts as a part? Is that even do doctrinally defined? Like, these are yeah. metaphysical issues. Um, and, like, timelessness. Like, well, maybe maybe there's some wiggle room there. I know Joshua Sidjuwadi has this really interesting metaphysics that he's developing, and he has this view of pluralism about ways of being. And so he says that God has a way of being, a mode of being, where he's timeless, simple, and immutable. But he also has a mode of being, and I'm not saying that this is his view, this might be a toy model that he's developing, but he also has a way of being, he as in Sijawati, <laughs> not, yeah, 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 yeah. not God. Uh, but uh, there's a different way of being where God is temporal. He can change maybe in his knowledge. He continually knows what time it is because he needs to update it right based on the changing world yeah. and those sorts of things. So he is a mode of being where he's timeless and he has different properties and so on. So does that fall into Catholic orthodoxy? Because you are you are affirming like timelessness and immutability and so on, that God does indeed have a mode of being in which that exists. But he also has these other modes of being that allow, <laughs> that, that don't succumb to the various objections from changing knowledge and other sorts of things and against divine simplicity from abstract and other sorts of things. So I want to look into the, the nitty-gritty of like, what are you required by divine simplicity? What are you required by divine timelessness? As it stands, the kind of traditional view, if that's what's required, like, you can't, I mean, I would probably lean towards Protestantism because of that. Yeah. Um, but you first, like, you first have to jump over the hurdle of like, does God even it, exist? Yeah, that's the before first one. Before you could get to the question of... And then, did Jesus raise from the dead? Jesus probably. The and dead. then, yeah, and then... And then probably it'd be model of God. Like, what is God like? Uh, and so here's something interesting, though. So Tim McGrew and Liddy McGrew, they have this paper in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. I've got it on my bookshelf mm -hmm. somewhere. And uh, I, that, looking at the bookshelf just reminded me that I forgot to turn all my lights on. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they've got this paper where they argue that the Bayes factor for the evidence for the resurrection is so powerful, is so high that it could overcome a really initial, in, like, a, a really low prior mm -hmm. pro probability of the, of the resurrection. So, what are your thoughts on something like that? If that is true, what would you say, like, because you're, you're only at, like, you're, you're agnostic at this point. So, your prior for the resurrection couldn't be too low. It would be low, but it wouldn't be, like, to the point where it couldn't be overcome by like yeah. significantly strong evidence. Yeah. So what would you think, like if you were to become convinced that their arguments for a high Bayes factor is, is correct, do you think that that would like maybe sway you toward Christianity? Potentially, yeah, potentially. I mean, I've only looked into the historical side just a little bit. Um, I've read a little bit of Dale Allison. I'm actually getting, um, what's it called? He has, uh, his new book is actually on Audible. So, and I love my audiobooks. I listen to them in between classes. No longer because now I'm in my gap year and then it's yeah. off to grad school. But yeah, um, but yeah anyway, my, my point is just that, uh, yeah, if, let's say, if I were to be convinced of yeah. the, those sorts of arguments yeah. for like um, a high base factor uh, that could sufficiently overcome a really, really, really low prior, uh, then, then yeah, I, I mean, I would probably 
become Christian. Um, so his base factor is 10 to the 44th power. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm quite skeptical of a lot of the yeah. points that they make. I mean, yeah. the independence assumptions and other sorts of things. But Yeah, right, that right. That is, yeah. That is one of the key yeah. assumptions. And, but, but, like, let's say that I were. Yeah, I mean, I... I because, I mean, I, I hope... I mean, listen, if we're talking in terms of my hopes, I hope a kind of Rasmussenian style universalist Christianity is true. Everything is ultimately redeemed. Creation is ultimately redeemed. Uh, even someone who is as disgusting and nasty as, as Hitler for an omnipotent God can shape characters, can change people, and change them for the better, can redeem. <laughs> if we can have hope, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I have a lot of hope in, in that sort of thing. Like, I hope that that kind of universalist view is true, and that people who, maybe in their earthly lives, they don't come to a doxastic, explicit commitment to God, um, but implicitly they're really committed to God. You know, like, if God exists, like, they are delving into these matters. They are really trying to pursue the truth. They're really trying to cultivate intellectual and moral virtues and these sorts of things. Um, I mean, they're already familiar with God just under a different guise. Like, they just don't know it yet, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, that's one response to the hiddenness argument that I actually find somewhat plausible. Um, the hiddenness argument in, in lots of different forms, not all of them, but lots of different forms, requires something like um, belief is, explicit doxastic belief, like affirming the proposition that God exists is a necessary precondition for being in a relationship with God. I don't find that plausible. <laughs> I mean, if God exists, um, people who are swimming in the depths of reason are swimming in the depths of God, really. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what I would say. So um, there's like a thousand different interviews we have to record today. So mm-hmm. unfortunately, this interview is going to have to be cut short. Like we're going to have to actually end it pretty soon. I just have one last question for you. Okay, I'm, I'm really interested in, in what your response is to this. Okay. I'm like building this up way too much. It's uh, not, yeah, it's it's not that like, big of a question. <laughs> it's, it's like rock or paper. Or scissors yeah. or <laughs> so the question is this. So a- as you were... You were laying out your story earlier, and you were talking about how you were leaning toward metaphysical naturalism, mm-hmm. okay? And it was based on one of the, one of the main things that you talked about was this sort of evolutionary style problem of evil, mm-hmm. okay? So my thought on the problem of evil is that even if it is successful, it's really only an argument against like perfect being theism. Mm-hmm. It doesn't really have much purchase against like. Philip Goff's conception of God, where mm-hmm. God is perfectly good, but he's not all powerful. Yeah. So, what would you like? Do you think that the problem of evil is really like a good argument that can support metaphysical naturalism, or would you say that it's really just more of an argument against perfect being theism? Because I I don't know how much like even if the argument is successful, I don't know that it can really support a metaphysical naturalist worldview like completely. It may it may like be one evidential chip in favor of mm-hmm. metaphysical naturalism, but because there are so many other options out there, so many other theistic options, like how much evidence does it really provide for naturalism? I I don't think it provides that much. Mm-hmm. So what well, what are your thoughts on on that? Is like as it pertains to where you were, your evolution that that playing like a big part in your becoming an, a metaphysical naturalist. Do you think that it was like maybe I don't know. Well, I mean, one thing we should note is that that's just one little evidential chip. I mean, um, we, we can't hope to scratch the surface of uh, the various evidential chips and so on from various different aspects of reality. Uh, so that's that's just the kind of salient one that got the process going okay. and that I still find quite plausible. Uh, but there are, I, mean, I don't want to say dozens, I was going to yeah. say hundreds, but uh, <laughs> it's probably more like dozens more evidential chips to consider um, before and against so that, that's one thing that I wanted to say. Okay. It's, just, it's not just that. Um, okay. It's, it's okay. this whole fortress, really. Um, but setting that aside, I do think when you're doing these sorts of Bayesian arguments, I mean, you really have to... I like the odds form of, of Bayes' theorem. It's really intuitive. You just look at the ratio of the, the priors yeah. and the, the likelihood of ratio. So you're picking two hypotheses. So you would have to pin, let's say, metaphysical naturalism against, let's say, perfect being theism. Mm-hmm. You get a different probability assessment if you pick different hypotheses. Yeah, right. So if you picked a kind of Philip Goff or however you pronounce it, sorry. Uh, if, you pick that kind, right. if, you, if you pick that kind of theism, or if you pick a kind of, um, Draper has this interesting proposal of a kind of aesthetic deism hypothesis. So um, God isn't, isn't attuned to value considerations of goodness and badness, but rather just aesthetic values. So he's just interested in making a good story. It doesn't matter about the, whether it's um, morally good or bad, but it's an aesthetically good story. So the, you could compare that with metaphysical naturalism. You'd get a different assessment because yeah, they just they yeah. predict different data. Um, yeah. And so it's really complicated. I would say if you're comparing the perfect being theism and naturalism, I would think it's a pretty significant evidential chip. Um, but it would be less significant against 
uh, Goff, his view. I mean, you'd have to flesh out the view, and maybe it wouldn't even be one, um, or it'd be different. So that's what I would say. I'd say it really just depends on the hypotheses. Uh, and against those other ones, we could talk about other issues, like intrinsic probability. Um, like the very fact that God has all these omni-attributes in one area gives you good reason to expect that he has an omni-attribute in this other area, mm-hmm. so that if he doesn't, you have a kind of probabilistic tension. You know, you've mm-hmm. heard about probabilistic tension in fine-tuning arguments, um, and, and things like that. So... It all, it all depends. Uh, the lay of the land is so complex. Yeah, yeah. Which is an fair, invitation to agnosticism. <laughs> fair enough, fair yeah. enough. Well, thanks for coming on. It's been awesome. And we're going to, like I said, we're going to be recording a whole bunch of stuff in the background. So just stay tuned to the, ta- to the channel. I'm going to be posting these interviews that we're doing in person at some point. This is uh, one of the only ones that I'm doing live. So I've got Alex O'Connor, Trent Horn after this. Uh, Alex and I might be recording on Sunday or Monday. And I don't know if, that's one, if that one's going to be live. But uh, we're also planning on doing like a joint where all four of us are doing a, a, a video together. We've got a lot of stuff planned, including the CC Exchange, if you're just joining us. The reason why Joe Schmidt is here in person and Alex O'Connor and Trent Horn is because, let me put it up on the screen one more time. We've got a CC Exchange happening tomorrow in Houston, Texas. If you're in the area, there are still tickets left. The link is in the description if you're interested in coming out. But yeah, that's what we have going on. And thank you guys for tuning in. And we will see you in the next Capturing Christianity video. I've got my hand on my phone because I'm actually about to push the outro video. But uh, thank you guys for tuning in and we'll see you in the next video. Peace. Hey, it's me again. Uh, Actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in